Hi, in this video, we'll talk about quasi-static processes and reversible processes. It's a topic I've been avoiding for quite some time. In fact, your textbook does it much earlier. In chapter 3, in section 3.4, in discussion of thermodynamic processes, your textbook already started discussing quasi-static and non-quasi-static processes. It's a good discussion um, with the illustrations of PV diagrams, but I thought you would appreciate the subtleties better if you have seen some examples of realistic thermodynamic processes, and then if you had to think about if these processes that you've heard about were now quasi-static, reversible, and all that stuff. So, now we are going to talk about quasi-static and reversible processes. Let me use these two cycles as examples. The first is the Carnot cycle, and the second is the Oro cycle. And this is the place I want to start from. I want to start from the claim that these both cycles are quasi-static. Now, maybe it's easier to believe that the Carnot cycle is quasi-static. After all, it's made up of isothermal processes. And here you can imagine that the gas is at constant thermal equilibrium with the surrounding. And for the adiabatic part of the Carnot cycle, you could say it's very well thermally insulated instead of undergoing a very rapid process. And the rest of the Carnot cycle are the same. The Oro cycle might cause a little more conceptual difficulty because when you're thinking of the Oro engine, there's a little explosion, internal combustion that happens at this point. And all of a sudden, the temperature of the gas rises. We even say it's so sudden that the volume has no time to change. Pressure suddenly goes up to this point. And if you are looking at that real-world process, you're right. That's not quasi-static. But what we are looking at instead is not that real-world process. It's this idealized isochoric process that's diagrammed in the auto cycle. And here's an important and subtle point to understand regarding which processes are quasi-static. Every process that can be diagrammed on a PV diagram is quasi-static. It's because drawing this path implies that pressure and volume are well defined at every step along the way. And that's only possible if this process happens quasi-statically. Or at least we are idealizing the real-world non-quasi-static process as being a quasi-static process. That's uh, kind of what your textbook is getting at here. They drew a path for the quasi-static process, and they tried to somehow indicate that non-quasi-process didn't have a path that you could draw. Um, you simply have a starting point and the end point, and how it gets there, you don't know. So that's one reason I didn't really want to talk about the quasi-static and non-quasi-static process distinction because almost every thermodynamic process we analyze is going to be quasi-static. Otherwise, we can't analyze it since there's no path to calculate work over and calculate heat transfer over. Now, lest you think we never dealt with a non-quasi-static process, there is one example we looked at that is non-quasi-static. That example we looked at was also in chapter 3. In section 3.6, as we were discussing adiabatic processes, it was under the term free expansion of a gas. A textbook called it adiabatic process, but I like to keep them separate. Adiabatic process is this process here that you have seen that is quasi static, and free expansion of a gas. It, uh, it's your own thing that's not quasi-static. Even though the free expansion of a gas might fit the definition of adiabatic process, zero heat transfer, 
The reason I want to set it apart as its own thing is whereas adiabatic expansion can happen gradually, that's what quasi-static means, with a free expansion of a gas, the partition has to be suddenly removed. It's on or off. There's no in-between. Let me be more specific what I mean. Alright, so here's the free expansion as illustrated in the textbook. And let me try to illustrate this on a PV diagram. So initially the gases have some volume and some pressure. With the sudden removal of the partition, the volume of the gas increases. And your textbook does go into careful description of why the temperature of the gas shouldn't change. That means using the ideal gas law, the pressure goes to half of what it was. Now, at this point, you might be tempted to say, oh, that means I guess this is an isothermal process. So let's say it's isothermal. And that would be wrong. Because if it were isothermal, what that means is that there's this area under the curve. And for the temperature of the gas to remain constant while will it's doing all this work, there must be heat flowing into the gas. That's isothermal. Now, these descriptions are completely contradictory to how this system of gas was described. It's in a well-insulated box. There is absolutely no heat transfer. There is absolutely no heat transfer with the outside. So none of this description makes any sense. So let's undo. So how can we describe the process of the gas changing from this state here? to this state here in the free expansion? Well, the short answer is you can't. There's no point in time in which the gas had three halves of V0 as its volume. Um, that point in time didn't exist. At one moment, the gas had the volume of V0. There was a very brief moment while this free expansion was occurring where the volume of the gas was not well defined. And at that point, the pressure of the gas was also not well defined. So who knows what that is in between. But at that moment, the volume of the gas reaches 2 V0. So the path from the initial point to the final point is not well defined. That is what it means for a process to be non-quasi-static. It is impossible to draw a path on a pressure volume diagram. So on the flip side, if we drew a path on the pressure volume diagram, then what that means is at a minimum, we are idealizing the process as being quasi-static. Because that's the only way a curve in a pressure volume diagram has any meaning. All right, hope that makes sense. Now let's move on to the next item of reversibility. So suppose I have convinced you that both of these processes are quasi-static. Then this is the claim I want to start with. They are also both reversible. Well, um, that's not technically right. They are both potentially reversible. I add this weasel word, potentially, because you can make these processes irreversible. In fact, you can even make the Carnot cycle irreversible. Here are two easy ways to make a thermodynamic process irreversible. The first is kind of a familiar one, one that you've seen in Physics 4a, is you introduce friction. As you saw in Physics 4a, whenever you have friction, you can't just uh, reverse the direction of time because friction always takes away energy, it doesn't add mechanical energy source of irreversibility that we are going to spend more consideration on is the irreversible flow of heat. Now, not all flow of heat is irreversible. If that were the case, the Carnot cycle would have been irreversible a long time ago because along this isotherm, there is a heat transfer. But the way we idealized the Carnot cycle was that this heat transfer happened reversibly. This is what we mean. We were careful to state that if this isotherm is at some temperature TH, then the temperature of the high temperature reservoir 
was also th. So the heat flowed between two objects that were basically at thermal equilibrium. So this is what reversible heat flow means. With these infinitesimal temperature changes, heat could flow either way. So irreversible flow of heat would be where there's a temperature difference. The heat flowing due to a finite temperature difference is irreversible. And this is captured in the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics that you must have looked at just before this lecture. Heat never flows spontaneously from a colder object to a hotter object. Leave the possibility heat flowing between two objects that are at the same temperature, the reversible heat flow. It's at this point at which an observant student might say, aha, I've got you. So the auto cycle is irreversible because this point is at the high temperature TH and all these four points are at different temperatures. So for example, when the system undergoes isochoric cooling in this portion of the cycle, the heat transfer must be occurring through a finite temperature difference from T1 to TL. The gas at high temperature T1 is releasing heat into TL, QED. This is where I want to highlight the potentially. Now, you're right. In a real world isochoric cooling process, it's very likely to be an irreversible isochoric cooling. But I think if we have proved anything, is that what we are considering isn't quite the real world. It's the idealized version of the real world. If you are dealing with the real cycle, the real auto engine cycle is not even quasi-static because of the internal combustion that happens. We already idealized that into saying, well, it can happen quasi-statically. So what we are going to now do is we are going to go one step further to concoct a very convoluted arrangement. And this uh, convoluted arrangement involves many grades of thermal reservoir. So, all right, let's say you have thermal reservoir at T1 and you do have thermal reservoir at TL. And what I want you to imagine is infinitely many thermal reservoirs between those two temperatures with temperatures that are spaced apart infinitesimally. I mean, it's not that convoluted. As a kind of realistic example, you could imagine, a, I don't know, a rod, where one end is kept at temperature T1, and the other end is kept at temperature TL. There would be a natural thermal gradient, and basically each point on this thermal gradient could serve as the thermal reservoir with infinitesimal temperature difference. With this setup, the heat transfer from the gas to the thermal reservoir at each of these temperatures is reversible. Now, just as in physics 4A, we always ignore friction and we always ignore air resistance whenever we can get away with it. We are going to do the same thing in thermodynamics. We are going to always assume that our processes are quasi-static. And you've already done that the moment you draw PV diagram. And we are also going to assume that we can make it reversible. So almost always, we'll be dealing with reversible processes. And from time to time, we will bring up, okay, how would this be different if this process were irreversible? But we are not going to get very numerical with it. We'll just give you some inequality that tells you how the reversible process is better than the irreversible process. And this practice is justified on really two grounds. One is that it's uh, necessary. You kind of need to make these assumptions so that the problems are solvable. The way ignoring air resistance made projectile motion questions solvable in physics 4A. And the second is that these are reasonable. Whenever you draw a PV diagram, 
you are drawing the quasi-static version of the process. And once you have made it quasi-static, by avoiding these sources of irreversibility, we can make it potentially reversible. So we'll use these assumptions to discuss some important limitations of heat engines under these idealizations, reasonable but idealizations still, and we'll talk about how any irreversibility that exists in the system will affect the result of the analysis. Until then, bye.